And some of the most potent prayers we've ever prayed have been maybe some of the simplest and shortest things we've ever prayed. I want to speak on Matthew 26, verse 36, down to verse 45. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which were James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went again away, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise let us be gone. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. I've called this message this morning, There is a struggle that comes with prayer. There is a struggle that comes with prayer. You know, I'm sure you would all agree with me that it should be both a joy and a privilege for the believer to talk to God. Would you agree? But this story here confirms to us that, and something that most of us know, um, prayer does not always come naturally easy to the natural man. It's not easy, it takes effort, and it is a spiritual discipline. Would you agree? Prayer is one of the most challenging spiritual disciplines a Christian can perform. The devil, the spirit of this world, and the flesh don't want to go there. Amen? Amen? And it always seems to be a mega battle if you're going to a prayer meeting. Amen? Yeah. just seems to be a fight. There seems to be obstacles. There seems to be hindrances. The reason why that is, is because it is such a potent and a worthwhile endeavor. This scene in our story this morning finds Jesus preparing himself for Calvary. He retires to the Garden of Gethsemane to get alone time with his disciples and also with his father. He's preparing himself for Calvary. This is his darkest hour. And this is where he gained the necessary strength to go through with what his father wanted him to go through. He took Peter, James, and John with him as he went to pray. He left the other disciples just a little bit further away. Jesus wanted his disciples to engage in prayer. But what did they do at his greatest, darkest moment? They fell asleep. This must have been naturally discouraging for Jesus. He knew exactly was what was about to happen. And he said to the disciples to pray with him. 
But three times he came back and they were sleeping. And so often, I believe that's our story when it comes to prayer. Would you agree? Before we give, oh, if I was there, I would have, I'd have been agreeing with them. I'd have been praying. Do you know what? This story about Peter, James, and John is our story. So often, he wants us to pray. So often, he needs us to pray. And yet, we're literally asleep. And, you know, this reminds us that there's such a spiritual battle with prayer. There's a, there's a battle in the heavenlies over us actually getting into that place that we need to. So, what is prayer? What actually is prayer? Prayer is essentially communion with God. It is not simply meditating upon God. It is an actual direct interaction with Him. I think sometimes people say, well, I'm meditating on the Lord. That's not prayer, that's meditation. And by the way, biblical meditation is okay. When we think of meditation, we think of these monks out in wherever in the Middle East doing whatever or in Asia. But I'm telling you, David meditated on the law of the Lord day and night. Prayer is fellowship with him. It's the way that believers communicate their thoughts and their desires toward God. It is when they open up their hearts and express themselves to the Lord. It's when they bring their petitions to God. A.B. Simpson says this, prayer is the link that connects us with God. Think about this. Prayer is our communion with the Creator, the one who created this universe, the one that created the human body. Prayer is when we talk to Him and we interact with Him. If you want God to draw close to you, and a lot of people today, they just don't feel God or they... They think God's far away from them. Well, if you want God close to you, then you're going to have to draw close to Him. I know we can complicate it and make it an A to Z. Hey, if you want God to be close to you, here's the A to Z. Well, James 4, 8 says, draw an eye to God and He will draw an eye to you. That's an incredible promise, isn't it? Who wants God to be close to them? Well, here's the answer. We draw close to him, he draws close to us. And by the way, prayer involves quality time. Quality time. It's a godly duty. It is a necessity for the child of God. It's relational. It involves intimacy and openness between us and him. The closer we get to him, the easier it is to glean the will of God. Now, I know there's people in this house this morning that are longing to glean the will of God. They're desperate for it. They need direction at the moment. They need to hear His voice. Well, here's the key. This is where you glean the will of God. In fact, when you get close to Him, you hear His very whisper. When you get close to him, you feel his heartbeat. You start to feel what he's feeling. You start to hear what is on his heart. See, it's those who are not close to him that complain they cannot hear his voice and they struggle with the will of God. So this here may help you this morning. If you're struggling, this here could be the issue that you're struggling with. Believers need him more than anything. They desire to unburden themselves to him. They need to hear his voice and they want him to hear their voice. Basically, prayer is to the spiritual man what breathing is to the natural man. The old Puritan writer William Law said this, Prayer is the nearest approach to God and the highest enjoyment of him that we are capable of in this life. You think that's an over-exaggeration? 
We're talking about intimacy here. We're talking about union and communion with God. By the way, what is salvation? Union and communion with God. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? That's what Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall. Perfect, unbroken union and communion with Him. It was unbroken. Today we live in a fallen world, so there's, there's, sometimes there's a void, a brokenness between us and God when it comes to our relationship with Him. Sometimes we're not even talking to Him. And then we wonder why He's not talking to us. We're just too busy. Too busy to talk to Him. Too busy to bring our petitions before Him. Brother, sister, true prayer is when heaven and earth connect. Prayer is aligning yourself with the heart of God and seeing Him work things out in you, through you, and around you for His glory. Charles Spurgeon says this, True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the Creator of heaven and earth. Scripture often depicts prayer as the believer crying out to the Lord. I don't always believe that means tears. It may involve tears, but when the Bible says such and a such person in the Bible cried out to the Lord, normally it's a cry for help. Uh, Jonah was in the belly of the, 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 the wheel and he cried out. I can imagine his prayer was, help! And sometimes some of our greatest prayers are that simple. You know, I believe that probably one of the most important prayers that I ever prayed was one of the shortest prayers, which was whenever I arrived on the reservation and realized the ginormous nature of the task, my prayer was this, Lord, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And that prayer probably lasted, you could time it, like three seconds, five seconds. And some of the most potent prayers we've ever prayed have been maybe some of the simplest and shortest things we've ever prayed. Amen? Amen. So I, I'm saying this, sometimes we get, our perception of prayer sometimes is wrong. And don't get me wrong, I'm not underestimating or in any way saying that long prayers are wrong. As a single man, my prayer life seemed to be a lot more and my prayers were a lot longer when I was single. I, I used to go to Newcastle for three or four hours and just walk and talk and then open my Bible and then talk and walk for three hours, four hours. I just, I'm not saying that I can't do that now, but it just seems there's more things pulling at me today than when I was single. Are you with me? Because we're talking about him today. We're talking about such an important subject. I went to a popular evangelical website that answers questions online, okay? And they asked the question, what is prayer? And this is what it said. The main idea behind prayer is petition, asking God for things. So, hmm. I pondered on that, and I'm saying, I don't agree with that. Now, I want you to stay with me, okay? Now, let me read that again. The main idea behind prayer is petition, asking God for things. Is that right? And this was a well-known, popular site. I mean, it's not a liberal site. It's normally pretty good. So I was, I was kind of disappointed in what it said. And you know what? I, I want to say this. To most Christians today, prayer is a selfish shopping list. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Lord, would you do this? Would you do this now? Or would you do this yesterday? And, you know, and give me this. And Lord, I need to do and, and sort this person out. They're annoying my head. And do this. And it's like, it's really us demanding of God to do ABC. I'm going to tell you as I read this book, that's not what I see in this book. Biblical prayer is, first of all, intimacy with Him. While we, and I want you to hear what I'm about to say. 
while we should bring our petitions or requests before God, we should. Prayer should be saturated primarily in humble thanks, praise, and worship. Not gimme, gimme, gimme. In prayer, we take the low place and God takes the high place. We acknowledge that God is greater than we are and ultimately knows what is best in any given situation. So we come humbly and that's why we bow before him. That's why people, because as we bow before him, we're, we are taking the low place and we are acknowledging him for who he is. Prayer is not us coming in with a swagger and going, right, Lord. And we have this in this day where people command God. We see it in some of the, back in the day, I, I don't watch it, but I'm saying back in the day, people would just order God to do this. Order God to do that and on some of the TV evangelists. Do this. And I'm like, what type of God do they have? And what type of Bible are they reading? Do they even read the prayers of Jesus? Read the prayers, how humble he was talking to his father. And they're commanding him to do this. I command you to do that. And I'm like, wow. We don't command him what to do. He commands us what to do. There's such, such a distortion and a deception out there in regard to this subject. A.W. Pink, one of my favorite writers, says this, Prayer is not so much an act as it is an attitude. An attitude of dependency. Dependency upon God. Prayer is a confession of creature weakness. Yea, of helplessness. Isaiah 66, verse 2 says, To this man will I look, even to him that is poor and is of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. It says in the word that he sees the proud afar off, but he comes close to him that is of a humble and a contrite spirit. If you notice when Jesus was praying here, he made comments like this, not my will, but thine be done. Here is the perfect example of how to pray. Lord, not my will. Lord, whatever you want, whatever you think is right, I'll go there, I'll do it. I'll pray that. We must come before God recognizing that we are undeserving of the least of his blessings. Would you agree? Do we deserve his grace, his love, his mercy? We have no divine right to anything of ourselves because we fall short of his glory and purity. <coughs> Humility, therefore, should mark our petitions. We should not be presumptuous. But equally, faith and confidence should mark our petitions if they are energized by the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to share some stuff here that could really change your life, could change your prayer life. So I want you to listen very carefully this morning, if you can. Um, You know, I read this yesterday and I thought, I know this isn't talking about prayer, but it says it all. Do you remember when Jesus came to the, the Gentile centurion's house? He was there to pray, pray for his child. The centurion said this in Matthew 8, 8. I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. And I was thinking about this and I'm like, should that not be our prayer? Like when he comes into your home, when he comes to presence himself, whether you're in the car, whether you're in Walmart, or whether you're just out and about and you're praying for somebody, is that not the way you feel with him? Like what, what wonderful word, words. I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But he does. And he wants to. He actually wanted to come into that house. He wants to come into your house. He wants to talk with you and meet the need in your home and outside of your home. All of us are probably familiar with the Lord's Prayer. 
I don't know about you, I lived in a day where we used to pray the Lord's Prayer at school. Anybody else ever experienced that? Okay. Back in the day where the whole school would pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, every day. Now the background behind the Lord's teaching on prayer is found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, as I highlighted a couple of weeks ago, the disciples never asked him, Lord, teach us to preach or teach us to evangelize. They, they asked him, teach us how to pray. Lord, we don't have a clue here. How do we actually pray? Well, then Jesus told them how to pray. In Matthew 6, 9, he said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. What he was saying is, pray like this, or pray in this manner or this style. He wasn't saying you had to pray the Lord's Prayer word for word every time you got into his presence. That's what the religious do. Would you agree? And it's funny that he actually was rebuking before that repetitive prayers. He talks about the heathen or the religious praying the same old prayers over, the same prayers, same time over and over again. It was just a ritual. And that's something we need to be careful about when we pray. That we don't get into a ritual of praying the same thing and we forget that it's a fresh conversation that we're having with him. But what he did is, he, said, he says, basically, this is a model prayer for you. This is, it gives you key pointers that you need to cover when you're approaching the Lord to pray. Listen how it starts off. Our Father. That's personal. Our Father. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's worship. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now please notice at this stage, there's no you asking for anything. Would you agree? Like, what is this all about so far? It's all about him. It's all about his glory. It's all about his will. It's all about his kingdom. He said, this is the way that I want you to pray in this manner, this style. By the way, the word hallowed here is a word of worship and veneration. It's, it's the child of God just saying, Lord, we worship you this morning. We honor you this morning for who you are. You're my God, our Father. Lord, we come into your presence with humility, realizing that you're in control here. It's only after this, after we have acknowledged God for who he is and recognize it's not our will, but thy will be done. Amen? Amen. Do you know that I prayed that for years? Ritually in school. And I never noticed until I come to Walt Hill, I never grasped a revelation of it, that thy will be done. And thought about it. I prayed that for years and I never got that part. Thy will be done. Just like, he says, this, this is the way I want you to pray. And like I've always thought, yeah, you know, he prayed this prayer, not my will, but thine be done. But he taught us to pray that. So one of the things is, instead of you coming to God and saying, Lord, would you sort this out, that out, that out, that, you come and say, Lord, your will be done. So then he goes on. And the good news is, by the way, we're allowed to bring our petitions before God and ask. We're allowed to ask for things. But that's not the preeminent thing. Because then he says, give, give us this day our daily bread. And give us, forgive us, us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God wants you to talk to him. God wants you to ask things of him. But he doesn't want that to be the overriding focus of the whole discussion. Are you with me this morning? Are you seeing that? 
That this is, he's saying, this is the type of way I want you to pray. And I'm telling you what, nobody was more of an authority on prayer than Jesus Christ. And I'm just saying, if you go onto a website, even if it's reputable, test it by the word. Test it by the book, because sometimes they can, people can take that advice in their millions and end up going down thinking prayer is all about gimme, gimme, gimme. By the way, that's why people get frustrated with God. That's why people question God. That's why people point the finger at God. Because it's like they expect God to stand attention every time they pray. But the reality is it should be the other way around. Whenever you're in communion, he's talking to you. You're talking to him. He tells you to do something. Yes, sir. That's true prayer. That's true intercessory prayer. God wants us to ask things of him. But God wants you to approach him with a proper understanding of who he is, what he teaches, and what he's capable of. Remember the words of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20? It says this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Okay, I'll read that again. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power, the power that worketh in us. What is that power? It's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's when the power of the Holy Ghost is working in you that he can do exceeding abundantly above anything that you're asking or thinking. Surely these words should generate faith in you this morning. They should give you hope. We need to come to him realizing that we're not trying to twist his arm. We're not trying to to take a hold of his reluctance. Like It's not like God doesn't want to bless you or God doesn't want to bless what you're praying for. I think sometimes we have that, like, well, I need to convince God here that this is a good idea. As if he's not getting it. It's like, I mean, how many times do I need to say this to the Lord? Brother, sister, he is perfectly aware of what's going to be good for you and what's, what's, what should be answered and when it should be answered. So that's another thing. When we understand who he is, then it has a habit of humbling us and making us dependent upon him when we approach him. Here's the good news. God delights in answering the prayers of his children who align with his will. Underline, align with his will. 1 John 5, 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything According to his will, he heareth us. You see that? You know, the name it, claim it, and frame it crowd think that they can just tell God what to do and he's going to do it. No. No. And by the way, your selfish desires and your selfish plans, if they are not in his will, you might as well talk to that roof. Amen? Amen. The reason many get discouraged and frustrated is because they pray according to their will and not his will. So how do we glean his will, preacher? Where do we find his will? By getting close to him and by reading the word of God. It is only by praying according to the will of God that we can have confidence and assurance that he will hear us. Am I taking that passage right or wrong? If you divorce living in the word from your communion with God, you will be all over the place spiritually. So my advice is stay in the word so that you're not ignorant as to what is his will and what is not his will. Through the word of God, you will see 
how the great men of God and the women of God engaged with God and how they saw answers to prayer. Through reading the Word of God, you'll see how he prayed and how he saw answers to prayer. Like, he prayed for help. He prayed for victory over the grave. Why did he even pray? Because he knew it was going to happen. Because he was aligning with the will of God. His words were exactly in line with the plan of God. Does that make sense? We have in our kitchen on the wall a statement by Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke one thirty-eight, And maybe it's something that we should introduce into our prayer life, which is, be it unto me according to thy word. When you come into his presence, what a prayer. Be it unto me according to thy word. God will not function outside of his word. Amen? Amen. Yep. It was a pastor I'm asked sometimes to do weddings. You get a believer and an unbeliever and they'll want me to marry them. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Why? Because I know what the book says. Mm-hmm. And I am not going to be an accessory to your crime, yep. to your sin. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to be honest. I talked to somebody in this last week about this. I don't have a difficulty marrying an unbeliever and an unbeliever or a believer and a believer. But a believer and an unbeliever is not right. So I'm just telling you that there's things, if you know the word, it helps you to know what to pray, know what to do, know what's right and what's not right. And by the way, it'll get rid of a lot of frustration in prayer when you know what the book says. Be it unto me according to thy word. Amen? Amen. By the way, the degree of spiritual success you enjoy will be related directly to the degree to which you take God at His Word and apply it to the situation you're praying about. A very powerful book that I have, probably one of my favorite books in my study, was written by four young men at Oxford University. Four really in touch with God, young men, back in the day. And they touch this subject, and this is what they say. We can now understand more fully the reason for so-called unanswered prayers. God's answer and His will may often be the very opposite of what would be most acceptable to the flesh. They continue. A recognition of God's sovereignty should make us more, not less, zealous in prayer. It is because God has promised certain things that we can ask for them with the full assurance of faith. A true recognition of this doctrine will also result in a greater desire to worship and praise our sovereign Lord. Real prayer is an act of worship. An acknowledgement of his goodness, power, and grace, and a submission to his will. The good news is, when the Spirit is at work in your life, he will impress prayers upon your heart that align with his will. If it is your flesh, then you'll be all over the place. And you will be bringing your selfish, deluded petitions toward God. Would you agree? Have you ever pr- prayed fresh, fleshy prayers? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me ask that question again. Okay, because there's only four honest people in this house. <laughs> Have you ever prayed fleshly prayers? Put your hand up. Okay. Who's glad that there's some things that you've prayed that God didn't answer? <laughs> okay. Do you understand? If we pray according to His will... I'm glad that he gave me a rubber ear a few times. I'm serious. There's actually people alive today should be glad of that. (laughs) Seriously. Don't you look all religiously at me because it's the same for you. How many people's alive today because God didn't answer your prayers and my prayers? 
Amen? There's probably a lot of politicians alive today and they should be glad. Amen? There's a lot of dictators alive. You know, people say, well, why are they still alive? It's a sign that God's gracious. Hallelujah. In fact, it's a sign that God's more gracious than you are. Yeah. Aren't you got, glad He's God and you're not God? Because yeah. the world would be in a mess. Yeah. Romans 8, 26 gives us some real solid wisdom. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit <coughs> itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Isn't that lovely? We have got help. We have got help to pray. This is such a sobering truth to take a hold of this morning. But it's very necessary if we want our Christian life to be profitable and fruitful. I don't want my prayers to be wasted. I've wasted prayers so much in the past. But I want my prayers to, to touch the throne room of heaven. We need to know without the assistance of the Holy Spirit, we don't have a clue. Amen? Amen. We are simply left with our own impulses. This tells me that effective prayer involves a reliance upon the promptings of the Spirit within us. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. It's really smart to get close to Him. It's really smart to listen to Him. And what I'm saying is, as you're in that place of prayer, the Spirit will actually give you the words that He wants you to bring before God. Isn't it good we've got help? So you've got the Word of God, and you've got the Spirit of God, and... They're helping you so your prayers will not be off here and off here. Your prayers will be right on target. E.M. Bounds, the great authority on prayer, writes this. We must remember that the goal of prayer is the ear of God. Unless that is gained, the prayer has utterly failed. Do you have the ear of God? Do you have God's ear? When you speak, does God listen? Or does God just tune out what you're saying? Because he knows what you're going to come out with. And it's like, here he goes again. Here she goes again. Just more old junk. Just more old flesh. I mean, honestly, it'd be heartbreaking to know that we don't have the ear of God. And I believe at times we haven't had the ear of God. Because we've been so tied up with ourselves. To be honest, a lot of people look on God like a genie in a bottle. When troubles hit, they call out to Him. When things are fine, they don't need Him. When things hit our nation, suddenly America becomes religious. Amen? Whether it's a footballer fighting for their life, whether it's a hurricane or whatever it is, then we suddenly get all religious and we start to talk to God. But what about the good times? What about the times of blessing? Do we thank Him and praise Him and glorify Him and just lift Him up for who He is? You're such a good God. You're such a faithful God. You're worthy, Lord. You're so gracious. You're faithful when I'm not faithful. I just thank you that you're my God. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. What's he laying on your heart today? What is the Holy Spirit laying upon your heart? Matthew Henry says this, What God requires of us, he himself works in us, or it is not done. Be under no illusion. God knows the sincerity of your heart when you approach Him. He knows the purity of your heart. He cannot hoodwink sin. 
He also knows what you need when you need it. Mm. So it's like, before I even ask, he knows exactly what I need. So it's actually good to come to him and say, Lord, what do I pray for today? You know what I have to pray for. What do I pray for? I believe prayer is a cooperation with the movement of the Holy Spirit. And this is where we become usable. The book that I previously referred to, written by those four young men from Oxford, the book's called The Grace of God in the Gospel, explains this. God in his infinite purposes has decreed that certain events shall come to pass. But he has also decreed that these events shall come to pass through appointed means. The preaching of the gospel is the appointed means for the working out of the eternal purposes of God. Prayer is another means. God has decreed the means as well as the end. And among the means is prayer. And so, instead of prayers being in vain, they are among the means through which God fulfills his decrees. The design of prayer is not to change God's will, but to accomplish it. Do you get that? We're not, we're not trying to twist his arm here. Because what he thinks and what he's going to do is going to happen. But as we pray, what's happened here is we are simply aligning with him. So that our prayers are just like he was praying it himself. And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is a perfect example of that. They continue. As we grow in grace and in the fuller knowledge of God, then his desires will become our desires and our prayers will be in accordance with his will. Listen to what Jesus instructs in John 15, 7. And this might help somebody here this morning. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. What's the key there? You abide in him, and his words abide in you. So as you pray, More and more, as we come into the place of prayer, we should be praying scripture or scriptural terms. Like I was reading yesterday a passage and it was just it was it was just talking about the goodness of God and the greatness of God. So it's okay for us to come in and say, Lord, just want to thank you for your goodness. Lord, I want to thank you for your greatness. I want to thank you for your faithfulness, for your honesty, for you know. What you're actually doing, you're, even though it's not maybe word for word, you're actually praying the word of God. Do you understand? That it's God's truth that's coming out of you. But if it's not in you, how is it going to come out of you? Mm-hmm. Right. So you end up, you're like, why am I praying that? Like, Have you ever prayed something that's like, that wasn't me. That was the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. So I want to urge you as you come into the place of prayer, actually let the Holy Spirit speak through you. Because it's those prayers that God will put his ear to. And it's like, yes, I'm going to answer that. Because it came from him and it's going to be fulfilled by him. So here's what I'm saying. It starts with him and it finishes with him. He lays this upon your heart. You hear it, you exercise it and walk in it, and then it it finishes with his answer to prayer, the blessing. I was talking to Peter about this this morning, just about blessing, whatever. Promises, blessing. But the promise is the promise. The blessing is the blessing. The blessing is the fulfillment of the promise. He promises this. If you do this, I'll do this. Another quote from A.W. Pink. And I'm coming to a close, by the way. I know it's a deep subject this morning. You listened really good. But I, I, I'm telling you, it's a deep subject. So please, I mean, there, there's a lot of nuggets in here this morning. I know that I maybe haven't put it across perfectly, but there's deep, deep truths in here this morning. A.W. Pink says this, 
Prayer is not the requesting of God to alter his purpose or for him to form a new one. Prayer is the taking of an attitude of dependency upon God, the spreading of our need before him, the asking for those things which are in accordance with his will, and according therefore, there is nothing whatsoever inconsistent between divine providence and Christian prayer. They should be aligned up. He continues, The same God who has decreed the end has also decreed that his end shall be reached through his appointed means. And one of these is prayer. The God who has determined to grant a blessing, Peter, also gives a spirit of supplication which first seeks the blessing. Brother, sister, if you grasp what we have talked about this morning, it could change your whole relationship with God and your whole approach to prayer. I don't know about you, I, I feel like we're on holy ground this morning. I feel like Moses back years ago where I feel like, first of all, I felt unworthy to cover this subject. I feel like taking my shoes off because I feel like I'm on holy ground this morning. We're talking about something which is at the center of our relationship with God. Amen. Yeah. By the way, if you love Him, you want to talk to Him. Mm-hmm. But I want to talk to Him in a correct way because I feel at times my prayers can be so imperfect. I want to hit the target. I don't want to be off here and I don't want to be off there. I really want to hit the target. I feel there's something in here today that God is trying to say to us that is of help to me, but it's also of help to you. Let us pray. How's your prayer life this morning? How's your communion with Him? Is it healthy? Is it intimate? Is it effective? I mean... Is your prayers being heard? I'm not saying that they've been answered in your time um, because that, that's never going to happen. Are your prayers been heard? Do you have God's ear? Or do you feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? If your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, then there's something wrong. Don't get me wrong, there's, there's an answer to that really quick and it's repentance. God, forgive me. God, forgive me for my selfishness, my carnality, for me trying to tell you what to do when you are here to tell me what to do. But I I just want to, how's your prayer life today? You're probably like me, saying it could be a lot better. So this is not to put you on a legalistic bondage. This is to inspire you. This is to enlighten you. This is to direct you because it's, it's been a help to me even studying this subject. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest this morning. When we get to the subject of prayer, are you convicted? I am. Are you convicted? And do you want to learn more about prayer? It, it's one of, of those important duties between now and seeing Him that we can't get wrong. Just want to urge you, just in your heart today, just... If you're like me, I've come into 2023 saying, Lord, I want, I, want, I want to be better in prayer. I want to be better in the Word. I want to be better at serving you. I just want to be a better Christian. When we meet on Friday night, it's an opportunity for us collectively just to let the Spirit give us things to pray and then we just need to open our mouths and pray them by faith. Father, thank you for the, your Word. Thank you for this, the truth, for the example that you've left for us of how to pray. Um, Lord, it's not a shopping list that we bring before you today. Lord, we just want to acknowledge you for your faithfulness toward us despite our shortcomings. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we worship you. We exalt you today. Even though we are imperfect creatures, that fail every day in word, thought, or deed. You never fail us. So we lift you up. We exalt you today. 
we cry for help. Help us on every aspect that we have covered. That the prayers in this church would be potent. That they would go up before the throne of grace and that we would see revival in this reservation. Lord, as these old buildings come, come down, as a new building comes up, I pray that there would be a spirit of prayer rise up in this house. And Lord, in the, this house that is to be built, Lord, that this house would be called a house of prayer. Lord, that we wouldn't need to force anybody to pray. Lord, there would be prayers in the cafeteria. Lord, there would be prayers in the, the bookshop. There would be prayers in the sanctuary. There would be prayers in the children's church. There would be prayers everywhere that this community would feel the impact of the prayers that we're praying because they were prayers that were impregnated to us from God. Help us, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen.